So we're heading on for the second last session in this conservation forum, and I'll be chairing it. Uh, my name is Mario Priha. I come from Helsinki Zoo, and I'm working in Conservation Committee and uh, Conservation Education Committee. And uh, so uh, during this session, we will once again hear great successful stories about as a member initiative is uh, kind of connected to species conservation. And uh, the first one to take the stage is Tatiana uh, Pochard. Uh, she's going to tell about the Sapari uh, Conservation Reserve work they're doing there. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so let me take you on a small trip into, into Peru and with the Chapari Ecological Reserve. It's an NGO we are supporting since 2001, so there's a lot of history behind it. And today we will focus on a small project we are developing there since uh, last uh, autumn in September. So what's first, uh, what's the Chapari Ecological Reserve? So it's a big area and it's the first private conservation area in Peru. Um, and to symbolize the long-term um, relationship between the community Santa, uh, Santa Catalina de Chongoyape and Heinz Plenge, um, they offered the family of Heinz uh, 100 hectares of land to have another private conservation area named Huerta Encantada. Um, and it's a really important area in the northern part of Peru because it is the last fragment of northern, um, of dry forest there. So um, it's really important for us to, to help them out. But what's um, important in Chapari, it's also the biodiversity there. Here you have two species um, really emblematic of the area. And there's a lot of uh, species there also. There's 250 plant species. There's 15 mammal species in total, um, five amphibian, um, 20, 283 birds in total, and 23 reptile species. So we are not only protecting uh, the spectacular bears there, we're also helping the other ones. As you may know, um, this bear is endangered, and it's the only bear in South America. It's globally threatened due to habitat loss and direct persecution, and the wild population there is estimated at 14 individuals, and it's the highest density population in South America. So we are really uh, happy to protect them and be there for him, for them. And about the white winged swan, uh, just uh, on the picture here, it's critically endangered, and it's because of habitat loss and illegal hunting, and it has been reintroduced in the reserve, and last year there were 85 individuals, and back in 2006 there were 28. So, what, what are the aims and missions of Chapari? Um, so as you can see, we have kind of four pillars, and behind that we also want to protect the rest of the endangered species there. We will also want to find social and economic um, alternatives for the local communities there. We want to develop communications between the community and other stakeholders, and we want the other community to benefit from our knowledge, um, from our experience there too. But first, um, if we are talking about Chapari, you have to see it, and this is the mountain we are working around it there, and it's the only um, other sacred mountain in uh, South America apart from Machu Picchu. 
So there's also a really strong spiritual and cultural aspect there, not only conservation project around species and um, development of local populations. So now we will go back on uh, a bit on what has been done since 2001 there. Then we'll take an example on how we can save species together um, between an NGO and uh, our zoo. And it's a really recent one because it was created and implemented since last September. So I can't go through in details, but this is what we've been doing since 2001 there. And saving spectacle bears has, had been the first priority since 1999 and the creation of the, the NGO. Um, and also we are all trying to raise awareness um, with a different uh, mission, different action than in some other uh, NGOs. We created with them a football competition. Uh, and some years ago, Peruvian Championship even had to cancel their own games because it was more popular and two football players from the national team came to Chapari to spend the day with the kids and learn about spectacle bears. So if we, if, we go, um, if we start to talk about this project between uh, spectacle bears and honey, um, I have to show you one of the pictures um, that Francois took on, on their trip uh, last February um, with Pierre. So this is the Meliponario we will talk about. Um, but first, how did we get to this program? What do we want to achieve? Because that's also why we, we arrived there. Um, so when they, when they were there on February, they spent one week only focusing on this program, seeing how it's going, what's happening there, how the community is reacting. Um, so what you can see is that inside you, you will have beehives, and in each beehive you can find one species um, of bee, stingless honeybee, so that's why it's easy for people to work with, and the protection is especially for predators. And I also have to say that we are the major financial supporter of the NGO since 2001. And when Pierre was back there, I installed him that without our support, uh, the NGO would have disappeared due to the uh, problem they have in Peru with the mafia and people wanting to buy the land and stuff like that. So it's really important for them for, to have us there and here um, to, to, to help them. So um, first we had to think about what's the situation and the context and what can we do to help them. And with all of these uh, questions and um, points you can see on the slide, um, it, it helped us to see that we needed to find a project including all of these um, themes and we wanted to be able to raise awareness um, uh, with this program. We wanted also to change the economic uh, way of living of local population. And we also wanted to help the dry forest ecosystem without um, human presence also. Uh, so Heinz came with this idea of promoting stingless honeybee uh, to help the ecosystem, the population, and the, the wildlife species. And the bees were also affected because of the lack of environmental education um, and the absence of economic alternatives. So it was also a way to help the bees there. Um, and there's, this problem is really um, occurring in several communities around Chapari. So we know that even if we started this program in Chapari, we can develop it and implement it around it and increase um, our population, also involvement in, in the project. So like I said, we are visiting them and we are supporting them. And it's really important because we are on a daily basis exchanging with them, but being there and seeing what's happening there, how they're implementing and developing the project is always easier to talk about it afterwards and to advocate for it. Um, so you can see on the picture, on the, oh, sorry, the last one, on the picture here with Pierre, it's Heinz, the creator of the NGO, and it's Ricardo, our biologist there. And so they were showing uh, how it's working, how they're uh, handling and managing the bees. And so 
afterwards we can we can share it here with you on our social media and stuff like that um, so we can also exchange with new people local stakeholders there and help um, uh, explaining them uh, what we're doing it's also easier with that so uh, I have to say also thank you to our partners for this project. Um, this is the partners from last year, and I have to say thank you for the support of uh, UNESCO Chair University of Genoa, because they're, they're helping us to value and preserve the much culture, the local culture, and the forest as a sustainable resource also. And so we are also helping them and we are communicating and that's really important because if we want this program to work and develop we have to talk about it here but also there um, we want them to be a part of it so we have to talk about it if we want people to join us and we also want them to help us with this project so that's also a way and one of the last um, tool we can use it's the comic book Pierre uh, co-written just uh, this year and there's 18 projects on it, and we are telling what's happening there, and we are, there's an history uh, inside, and of course, um, Chapari is one of them. Um, so you can see a bit more about what's uh, Meliponario and what are the behaviors we use. Um, so the first step when we decided to implement this program was to set up Meliponarios. Uh, so we now we can say that there are seven in use, four in Chapari and three in Tokmoche, another community around. Um, I told you you could find between one and eight species inside every Meliponario. There's one species per beehive, and the smallest one is about 2.5 millimeters and produce six centiliters per year of honey. So it's also um, maybe something we can value and we will come back to this. So step two, this was uh, last February that uh, they took the picture. Uh, this is the, um, some, some colony um, you, can, you can find on the beehive. So we are also um, thinking about collecting honey and valuing it, but we need to know what we can do with it. So we need to analyze honey. And it's kind of tricky for now, so we are still working with them on how we can do it, which uh, analysis we could do, and how we could value the honey, because stingless honeybee has a higher moisture um, in content in the honey, and it facilitates fermentation, it has a lower pH than happy smellifera that we know more, and it's, it has a more acidic texture. So it's not as easy as we thought, but still, we will go and see how we can help them. Um, we already did uh, a first uh, set of analysis, but we think that we need to analyze more um, different honeys from different species we have in the in the meliponarios. So we'll see what what's gonna go after for this one. But we have good hope that we could uh, really develop an economic and friendly alternative for the po local population there. And what's the idea behind? Because it was not only um, the, the project itself that uh, was important for us. The idea behind was to create a biological corridor for all the wildlife living in Chapari and around between Chapari and the Andean summit because there's a lot of population there of spectacle bears, condors, or other species, and we want them to be able to travel um, from Chapari to the Andean summit and backwards. And for that, it's for now really too much for us to buy per and purchase land there. So we are thinking about including other communities with Forest Guard, um, and they will be part of the, the ecological reserve. And then we will be able maybe to set up meliponarios there, and then the dry forest ecosystem could be regenerated, the different species could benefit of it, and the local people could also uh, benefit from this project. So, And we already know that three other communities want to join us, so we know that we can start slow with these three communities and then see what could happen next. So that's, um, that's a really um, interesting project, and we are really happy to be able to help them and to uh, see uh, change and positive change for, for the dry forest ecosystem.
So thank you for your attention and for um, this project. If you're interested in, I would be happy to answer any questions or to talk about it later with you. Okay, and I'm, I'm really delighted to ask Esther Conway to tell about the wildlife, uh, wildcat conservation and connection to zoos. Mm -hmm. As you probably know, Helsinki Zoo has been involved in, in, in that uh, conservation effort for 20 years. Maybe the presentation is not about that, but anyway. So yeah, I'll, I'll help you. lost the connection with the mouse and the services. So hi everyone, um, what a brilliant conference. It's been so amazing to be here together with you all. Um, so um, as you hear, um, I'm Esther Conway. I'm gonna to talk to you about Wildcats Conservation Alliance. So I'm just going to give you an overview of what Wildcats is. Um, Normally I would spend um, a lot more time focusing on the Wildcats funded projects and talk about their impacts and talk about how you guys as zoos could get involved if you're not already. Uh, but this year the EASA team have asked me to explore if the Wildcats model is actually, uh, could be potentially be used for other taxa. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about that as well. So, if you don't already know, Wildcats is an ammo leopard and wild tiger conservation initiative of the Zoological Society of London and Dreamworld Wildlife Foundation. And it's run by zoos for zoos, and it's been actually bridging that gap um, in the one plan approach for many years. It's got a long history of funding projects uh, across Asia using carefully selected uh, conservation experts to uh, advise us. Um, all proposals are peer reviewed to ensure that they're using uh, best practice and uh, actually using new techniques and knowledge. So the projects comply with Wildcat's requirements for obtainable outcomes, measurable <coughs> objectives. They contribute to country-specific action plans and work with local and national governments. <coughs> That's really uh, important. And of course, we share the reports, the information, the stories and blogs that come from these projects with our um, supporter zoos so that those zoos can then use that information to inspire and inform their visitors. And this is just a, a very recent example of what we've done with uh, uh, Natra Zoo Rhine, um, who were redoing the <coughs> interpretation outside their tiger enclosure. So zoos 
actually have made up about 65% of our donors since 1997. And actually, when we look at the last 10 years, it's more like uh, 70%. And 124 zoos have donated uh, 2.6 million euros in the past 10 years. And out of those 124 zoos, 30% of those have actually donated the majority of the funds. Um, but another 70% have been able to donate much smaller amounts, but together have made such an impact. So the projects we support, currently we're funding nine projects, and they follow a variety of themes. Six of the projects are reducing key threats to tigers and ammo leopards in uh, Thailand, Nepal, Russia, and Indonesia. So, patrolling and wildlife crime investigations are really important and they follow the best practice uh, using things like uh, patrol management software like SMART to ensure that they're recording and analysing their data effectively. Collaborations are established with local law enforcement. Local people are seen as part of the solution and not the problem. And proper funding is supporting the skills of the rangers. So one example of this is one that you probably have heard me talk about before in Karinchi Seblat National Park in Sumatra with uh, FFI. And we've been supporting them with grants since the year 2000. And these long-term grants are really important. So their reactive, intelligence-led patrol strategies have been proven to reduce, uh, or sorry, increase snare detection by 40%, helping to uh, keep the poachers away and also protecting about one third of the current uh, Sumatran tiger population that lives within uh, that area. For the fifth year running, this is um, you know, really key for us, these smart patrols have, have reported that direct threat to Sumatran tiger levels through snaring and other threats are well below the project average. And the snare, the, um, the, the data that we've collected suggests that the long-term project average is about one snare per 17 days. And actually, in 2021, um, they uh, recovered seven snares across nearly 400 days. So that's really great improvement. And it's a similar area, same number of teams. Uh, so this data is really showing a decline in the snares. Uh, um, and you can see in here, um, sorry, I should be using the pointer for this. Uh, is this, this? So this shows um, the reported tiger presence um, that the, the patrols meet, and this is the decline in the um, snares. And it's great to see these two together because it does show that this um, key uh, methodology is working. And another example of the wildcats' work is uh, <coughs> reducing. Uh, in reducing key threats is in Pasa National Park in Nepal, where we're working with ZSL. It is the actual, the only ZSL funded, or ZSL project that we fund. Um, and they are working to build resilience within local communities. So reducing their reliance on the forests for livelihoods, fostering human wildlife coexistence. Um, supporting vulnerable families such as this one with helping them build predator-proof corrals to protect their livestock overnight. And results are showing that 40% uh, of local people are, are, are really have positive feelings towards tiger conservation. Now, we've still got a long way to go from that kind of baseline because 
it still means 60% are unsure or, or feeling negative. So, you know, this is a really good baseline for us to w be working um, to increase. So another of the conservation themes is the... Um, is deepening the understanding of population ecology. And this is being done through um, monitoring. And as you know, you do need to have monitoring projects at the same time as your conservation uh, efforts, your protection efforts, to be able to see whether your, whether your, your work is actually um, making a difference. And it allows you to then have a kind of adaptive management strategy. So we are currently funding, funding monitoring projects in China, the Russian Far East, and Thailand. And one example um, of that is in Thailand, the Kowlem uh, National Park with Freeland. And it's an area very close to the Myanmar border, which brings a lot of issues with uh, people coming across the border, whether they're... Um, um, uh, migrants looking for uh, a, new, a new home or whether they're the uh, army looking for poaching. Um, so it's, it's on the edge of an area that's called the Western Forest Complex and the, um, that's a really key collection of national parks in Thailand that is really the, 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 the place that is the future um, or offers the best sec security and future for the Indo-Chinese tiger in Thailand. But this park, Kaolam, has been pretty understudied um, because it's on the edge of the Western Forest Complex. And so we, over the past three years, have been providing funds to actually have a, a, a really good look at that park to... to to see what's happening. And they have actually been able to identify uh, both resident tigers and also tigers that are moving through that park, coming out of Myanmar or just moving through into deeper into the Western Forest Complex. And, th um, and that gives us ideas of where the um, uh, corridors are. And so it also allows them to identify and understand some of the threats mm -hmm. and the requirements. And we're working in China uh, since 2012 with uh, WCS and it's obviously an important site on both sides of the border. So uh, long-term data again is showing a, a really uh, upward movement of uh, in, in the study site. I have to say in the study site it's really important that we recognize that. Um, but this park is now part of the Northeast uh, Tiger and Leopard National Park in China that is uh, the, the largest protected area for ammo leopards and tigers. Uh, we're also working across the border with WCS in, in Russia so that on both sides of the border where animals are of course are moving across, they are um, measuring the data in comparable ways. And again, that's really important. So another, um, another theme to our projects is creating a, a sustained cadre of knowledgeable <coughs> experienced conservationists, basically capacity building. Um, and Wildcats helps build strong in-country teams uh, with, through all the projects, encouraging professionalism and, um, uh, and, prov and uh, encouraging training. And so we've also launched this year, the additional bursary uh, celebrating Year of the Tiger. And that bursary is uh, going to provide funds uh, for a conservationist working within one of our existing projects um, that has less than 10 years' experience, that's already employed um, by a project, um, and we're going to be flexible on that. That's really important. So they could come to us and say they want to write a paper they could want to do a piece of research. It could be that they want to take part in a certified training course over a period of time. Um, and it could be um, that they want to attend a conference, a conference where they can present their work and learn. So um, that is happening this year uh, for, for, well, uh, being launched this year for next year. So that gives you a, a kind of overview of what we're doing. So Wildcats is a successful model for collaboration. It's, it, 
it's been in existence since the 1990s. First, you know, as 21st Century Tiger and Alta, and then uh, in, with the new name under Wildcats. And it's run out of ZSL as part of the society, and it's embedded in the conservation department, and all the skills and expertise are there to help us. And crucially, it, in, it, it offers long-term funding to projects and can often be used you know, as that sort of bridging funding between other projects, which is really key when you're running a conservation project. So it's become a, a kind of trusted and honest broker for zoos to know that we are managing the, their donations well and reporting back. And I think um, that, that, again, is another really important aspect of what we do. So crucially, Wildcats um, has long-term operational funding through Dreamworld Wildlife Foundation. And... We're really lucky because that then allows us to give 100% of all of the donations that, that zoos are giving us. Um, that, um, you know, that 100% that, that can go to the field projects. Um, but we're lean to run. There's only two of us. Um, so we don't have a huge budget, and most of it goes on salaries. So is this model replicable? Well... <clears throat> That's really hard to uh, reply, and I was like, oh, God, what do I say about this? So, actually, what I'm going to do is, is, is just pose some questions. Um, is your fund actually needed? If you're thinking of setting up a zoo-based fund, is it actually needed? There are plenty of other ways to get money into conservation, and setting up another one is actually just going to kind of um, provide... Uh, too much choice for certain people. Um, will the taxa inspire donors? I mean, we're working with the charismatic. But, you know, there are other organisations like, uh, like ZGAP who are working with the little brown jobbies. Um, and they're doing a really good job of marketing those. If you're going for that kind of um, taxa... Do you have those skills to inspire your donors to give money for something that's not charismatic? Because you need a certain set of skills and imagination to be able to turn that into something that zoos can then promote. One minute. Um, can you raise funds consistently? Because there's no point in having um, you know, a good year one year and then none the next. You, these projects need consistent funding. <laughs> Do you have operational funding to run the programme? You can't really run these programmes without a dedicated staff member. It's not, you know, you're just going to pick somebody out of your existing overworked conservation team and say, run this programme. You need to identify, you need to actually think about how you're going to fund it, how you're going to give it adequate funding f over a long period of time. And if, you, if, if you're going to run this within a zoo, can you tap into your zoo's resources? You know, can you tap into the digital, the marketing, the design teams that are already overworked? Or are they going to put you at the end of the list when you need help providing um, materials? The other thing that I was thinking is, you know, um, would, your zoo, would, would your zoo's fundraising team support your work? So, zoos fundraising teams are often focused on, you know, raising money for capital projects within the zoos. You know, the work that you need to do to improve your enclosures um, and to, uh, you know, change your visitor experience to bring more people in. And um, then, then if they're doing fundraising for conservation, they're going to be focusing on the projects that you guys run. So. Does that mean that they're going to be able to then turn around and help you with your fundraising with, with the zoo communities? Or are you going to be slightly in a conflict situation with them when you're both chasing the same money? And, you know, I'm just going to end by just saying, you know, can you be resilient against risk? Look at the last few years. We've had covid where if zoos are going to be your main source of income, all of a sudden they 
didn't have any money to give to <coughs> conservation. Black Summer, it, 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 you know, the, um, the Australasian zoos had to direct all their fundraising towards helping um, uh, conserve their own native species after the terrible fires that they, they suffered. There was no money for external uh, conservation. And war, you know, I, I just leave that there. You, you know, you just don't know when these things are coming around. And can you, have you got resilience to be able to uh, manage your program through those difficult situations? So thank you. So these are the ERs and members of that top 30%. I can't, um, I, I, you know, I couldn't get everyone in who's donated. It was impossible. So, um, you know, these, everyone of you is so important. And please consider, if you don't donate to us, please do. <clears throat> so this is how to get in touch with us. Uh, this is a, a absolutely beautiful uh, Amma tiger caught on camera by WCS. Um, and yeah, thank you very much. So uh, yeah, um, I did run over slightly. So maybe one question. Um, but we, I'm I'm here, so people can talk to me. If you haven't already talked to me, I do talk a lot. So. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Esther. I think, yeah, we need to kind of um, move on. Maybe Meryl can fix with the not moving mouse. Uh, but anyway, okay, welcome Elio Vicent from uh, Zoo Marine Algarve. And uh, he's going to tell about uh, very engaging operations where uh, kind of local people and different stakeholders are involved in, in conservation in your area. I'll so. try. Bom dia a todos. I'll do this in Portuguese, okay? You need to start you need to start practicing. I think so. Yes it is. Thank you. So of course I have to start with a little prince. It's just a question of self discipline. First thing in the morning you look after yourself, you brush your teeth and you wash your face, don't you? Well the second thing you must do is look after your planet. My co-author is João Neves. He's not attending because in about six, eight, ten days he will be defending his PhD on social psychology. Being a marine biologist is a cool thing, but I'm very proud that he's my co-author here on this project. And um, I've done a lot of things at Zoomarine in the last 31 years. The most important thing today I have to say is that for the last few weeks I'm director of conservation, and that's a very cool thing. João is the Director of Science Education, and if you get to go to Portugal next September, and I'll explain you why in a few minutes, you should definitely take the time to talk to João Neves. Now, the idea today is to talk about Zumarin, Zumarin in Portugal, and Zumarin, the place where you will have to go next September to attend the annual conference of IASA. The dates are September 27th, October 1st, but plan to stay about 20 days. You will not regret it. Now, Zoomarine uh, began its operation in 1991. We are a medium-sized park and a very small zoo. We have about 320 species, of which about 50 are butterflies, and we have about 1,500 individuals. We are located in southern Algarve in Portugal, just at the bottom, the most southwestern part of your where you can get. And this is the park, an area overview. We are over 40 hectares, but the visitors themselves have about 26 hectares to go to. And uh, we began just with seven hectares many years ago, just like that. But you'll get to see that when you get to go to Portugal. This is one of the most coolest things you can do. If you do go to Portugal, this is the man you want to meet. You will not regret any minute that you will spend with him. This is Pedro Lavia, the founder of Zumarine. He just turned 80 years old. But we're here to talk about cool things. We don't have time to go. This is really, really funny, but we have no time for that. So let's talk about Together We Protect, because in conservation, collectively we can, we should, and we must. So let's talk about some things that we do in cooperative terms.
And this is one of the challenges that progressive zoos have over the years, because we have to concentrate a lot of energy in many, many things. We are a kind of a heart gallery because we show very cool things. We are research centers. We are conservation centers. We are schools and universities, training centers. We act like foundations because we provide a lot of money, where we should provide a lot of money, to very cool projects in situ and ex situ. We are places of fun because we need the visitors or we like to have the visitors. But above all, we should be leaders by example. And that's what we try to do in cooperation terms. We are members of uh, a lot of professional associations. These are just some of them that are related to animals and animal welfare and husbandry, etc. Um, we are members of the EASA since 1999, and we were accredited in 2012, so 10 years ago. We were in the first lot of 30 institutions to be accredited by the AZA. And of course, as a member of the AZA, we're also members in several of the stud books and EEPs, as you can imagine. And because of that, I have a very cool example about this little guy. As you know, the Socorro Dove is extinct in the wild. There's less than 200 individuals, much less than that, in the world. But we were very honorable, honored to receive a few individuals uh, some months ago, as some of you might know. So in September, we received the males. In, this, in December, we received the females. And this presentation was done last Saturday and Sunday. At that time, I was very happy to say that now we have 2.2.2. But actually, I would be lying because I have the information since yesterday that now we have 2.2.3. And that's also very cool. As you can imagine, working in a zoo, you have to do a lot of things, and you want to do a lot of things in terms of science, conservation, uh, and engagement. We have a website dedicated to some of those projects. It's called Together We Protect, weprotect.com.zoomarine. And we have a very cool logo that we developed about 12 years ago. I, don't know, I will not go into details on these areas because I will not have the time and you would be bored to death. But one of the cool things we did many years ago was this. We created the first rehabilitation center for animals, uh, marine animals in Portugal. We began this project with several entities that were for at the beginning, of course, involving the government. There was no stranding network in Portugal for marine species and we developed this one. And actually the logo was made at Zumarine. So we created a project with the government, and we became in 1999 in charge of all the marine mammals in Portugal. So if there was a stranded seal, dolphin, or whatever, it would go to the marine, and the same thing regarding marine turtles after 2001. So we have a rehabilitation center. I'm the director of the center. It's called Porto de Brigo, and they're watching right now. Hello, Portugal. And uh, we were, as I said, for the many, for several years, the only rehabilitation center in Portugal. It's in the outskirts of Zumarin so that our visitors can watch. We have windows. They cannot enter. It, of course, is a permanent quarantine facility. And also, it's wild animals. They are going back to the wild. We never keep one single animal. And just yesterday, we sent another turtle back into the ocean. So we receive endemic terrapins. We receive some marine turtles, some river otters, some seals, these are the three main species that we receive in southern Portugal, and some small cetaceans. And as I said before, uh, this can be a big challenge. This is one of the biggest ones that we had, Kinesh. He was 298 kilos when he arrived. He was with us for about two months, and it was an amazing challenge. And this is Antonieta, one of the super women at Zumarin. Um, all of the animals go back into the wild, and as you can imagine, this is a partnership with many institutions, governmental institutions, NGOs, and a lot of international partners because we take the animals back to the ocean from where they are come from. So we took animals to the Netherlands, to the United Kingdom, to the United States, wherever they need to go, we take them there, sometimes by helicopter. Did I mention this? <laughs> we are hosting the annual conference in 2022. Rooms are getting very, 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 very few. And the early bird is quickly approaching, so don't forget about that. Now, let's talk about some of the cool things that we do in terms of cooperation with our institution. This is one of the things. We began in the late 90s to create programs to create expertise in Portugal regarding oil spills. We did have some expertise with the uh, Portuguese Navy, but other uh, stakeholders in Portugal did not have that expertise. So created projects. Some of them were funded by the European Union to create expertise and other husbandry and uh, um, guidelines in order to provide emergency responses not only to the animals, but also to the people Regard, involved in those projects. And this, of course, through Zoomarine and our rehabilitation center. 
We were also were the first ones in Portugal to have a national documentary being shot at. So they were doing that at Zoomerin because that was the only place where they could actually do ultrasound sonography in 3D to dolphins. So they went to Portugal because it was the only place in the world where that could be done voluntarily without removing the animals from the water. And again, the word is voluntary, cooperation, which is the word for the entire presentation that I'm giving today, cooperation. Now, as a progressive zoo, we always have to try to achieve this change, going from ego to eco, and that's a challenge, a daily challenge, an annual challenge, the challenge of the century. So there's a lot of things we can do. One of these things is a cooperation with one of the universities that we work with. We uh, develop a project with the university to use algae to create biofiltration systems for our aquariums. We also removed plastic for zoom marine operations many years ago, so now we just use uh, renewable options and recycle uh, materials. We also will be able to provide about 77% of our electricity uh, requirements by this summer. We have 2.5 hectares of solar panel areas, and we also have solar uh, thermal uh, panels to provide hot water for our daily operations. This is done with a, co with a company that is very famous in Portugal for that. Another cool thing that we do is we had to create a pipeline to get water from the ocean. It took me about seven years of negotiating uh, with the owners of more than 30 land, landowners. It took us almost seven years. But now we collect water from the ocean. It's almost five kilometers. But the cool thing, as you can see right here, there's a lagoon. This lagoon, it's called Salgados. It's less than a kilometer away from the hotel where the ASA conference is taking place at Zumarin, September. But the cool thing is, there's a lot of very special birds, very special species over there breeding every single year. And those waters are the waters coming from Zumarin. And that's a cool thing that we do with the government as well. Again, cooperation for nature conservation. We don't use pesticides. We cooperate with copets, so we use caterpillars, aphids, and mites to deal with our plagues or eventual plagues that we have in our gardens. Another cool thing that we have is this. Probably then, I, I, I hope that by the time you get to go there next September, you will be able to see this little space right here. This is a, a water... Waste, wastewater treatment uh, station that was uh, stopped in 1994. It's inside Zoomerin, but does not belong to Zoomerin. But we made an agreement with two institutions, and we will be transforming these operations into a conservation center. So within the next few months and years, we'll start breeding endangered species from Portugal in this former water waste treatment plant. And that's very ironic, I would say. Oh, I have five minutes. That's good. Let's make eight. <laughs> I'm joking. Well, when we're talking about conservation and cooperation, we know this is a very intricate uh, system. So we try to do very cool things. We work uh, with some institutions. This one is Project Delfin. They work with uh, dolphins in the wild. Uh, so they're our partners. We also work with World Parrot Trust. We provide them money and some expertise, and we help to tell their stories. And we fundraise, and uh, we send about 9,000 euros per year to these colleagues. We do the same thing with the Marine Megafauna Foundation. Not only provide money, but also we help them uh, pro provide some uh, research projects. We do research with our visitors' behavior, as, again, João Neves is working on uh, uh, social psychology. And that's a very cool dynamic with the Marine Megafauna Foundation. The idea is to change perception about sharks, for instance. This is all really, really funny, but we don't have time for that. So ask me during the, the, the coffee break. So now one of the challenges that we have at Zoomerine is engaging visitors and engaging other stakeholders outside of the park. We don't need to have people going into Zoomerine to have those people engage in conservation programs, etc. So we developed some projects with this uh, philosophy by Baba Diume that we're using since day one at Zoomerine. In the end, we'll conserve only what we love, and you know the rest. So we developed uh, several projects under this brand. We're using this brand for the last 12 years. Together, we protect. And together, we protect because we can, should not do things alone. So we devised this program, project that has four axes, land, ocean, people, and animals. So regarding those lands and oceans, one of them is we offer trees and we plant trees. The other one, we clean the beaches and the seafloors.
So with Green Mountain Operation, so we offer trees. The president of the, the, public, the Portuguese Republic gives their stamp of approval, and every single year we give 5,000 or 5,500 trees to each council, to each municipality. So that's a lot of trees over the years. And we offer the trees, we offer the food, the water, the instruments, even the compost in the partnership, and we give biological compost to the trees. And we give them also insurance to all the participants, digital um, certificates, and we plant trees, a lot of trees. This is an example at the university just last year, and we go all around the Algarve. We did five editions already. We involve over 8,000 volunteers, 16 hours over these last five years, 13 one partners, and we planted, we offered over 84,000 trees, and we planted more than 67. This year, we will do it again and we'll go to eight municipalities in the Algarve, so that's 50% of the entire region of the Algarve. We'll be planting trees and changing the landscape. That's what that sign means. So next November, we'll be offering some more trees, 42,000 more trees, so that means the total will be 126,000 in just six editions, 19 hours of plantation, and we'll probably reach 2,000, well, so 12,000 people planting trees for just two hours per year. But we don't do just trees, we also do bleaches. So Praia Limpa is exactly the same thing, but we just clean the beaches and the sea floors. The same thing, we provide all that the volunteers need, insurance, digital certificates, and then we go out and clean the beaches and the sea floors. We have divers collecting uh, trash from the sea floor. And it's very fun, we have people from all ages, all backgrounds, even very, uh, several nationalities, over 20 nationalities. And it's a great time at the beach, about two hours, every single year, but it's just two hours per year. Really fun, and over the years, we collected more than, well, almost eight tons, 8,000 kilos. I'm getting there, I'm getting there. Don't raise that. I know I have 10 min more minutes. I know, I know, I'm getting there. So, over 1,000 people, over 40 editions, and this is really cool, more than 35 partnerships. In the next few years, we'll do the same thing, but with animals and people. So we call living ark operation. That means we'll be removing exotic species in help to provide safe places for endemic endangered species with the cooperation with the Algarve University and a blue blood operation where we'll have our visitors and our staff donating blood once a year from our facility to the Portuguese hospitals. Did I mention this? I think so because I only have eight more minutes. So finally, the last project that I would like to address with you, again, with cooperation, has to do, of course, saving species. So this is the last, the last one. It's very cool. It's called phalanges. It's the number of bones we have in our fingers. So there's three plus five institutions, and we're going to save also three endemic, very endangered species of freshwater fish located in the Algarve. So we're acting locally. So because this is a very priority uh, project. It was very complex. It took eight years in negotiation. But we're finally were able to create a project which has a lot of conservation, science, and education for sustainability. I don't go, we'll go into the details, but ask me during the uh, lunchtime. And if you have chocolate, I will reply to you. This is the Secretary of State at the time of uh, um, conservation in Portugal signing the contracts with us. They don't provide money. They just say, that's cool, go ahead do your job, and we'll do it. These are the three species, Qualis aradensis, critically endangered in the wild. This one, rate it for yourself, it's all Al Makai, also critically endangered, and the third species is endangered of extinction, Lucio Barbus Clateri. Now, we did receive already some of the fish, only five. Unfortunately, one of them did not survive the first few hours after the trip. So now we have four individuals already, and this is what our visitors can see when they visit Zumarin. A very cool cooperation between these institutions. Mare, right over there, is a consortium of several universities that will provide the scientific background that we will require. And overall, this project will have a budget of minimum 480,000 euros for eight years. And we're getting to the end, and the end is this. A very, one of the very cool habitats that will be providing protection for the next few years, and if everything goes well, some fish. So, my last message is, together indeed we protect. That's our logo for the last 12 years at Sumerine. There's a lot of things that we can do, 
But one of the most important challenges is effectively getting cooperation with many other institutions and individuals, volunteers. They can be a very important and fun part of it. So in sustainable projects, we need to think about the future, and the future is not only zoos, but those who live where we are intervening. Because citizen engagement for us at Submarine is indeed a superb, fun, and ethical opportunity. Because indeed, together we protect. And I have to end with this one. You know it, but I need to read it because I think it's very cool and it's like a lemma for us. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. And we truly believe that at Submarine. Thank you so much for your attention. There is no time for questions. I'm sorry, but maybe during lunchtime we'll have. And if you need to reach me, find me in Portugal next September. Is that okay? Thank you very much. Speaker will be Bridget Johnson from Snowsley Safari, and uh, we will hear about uh, zoo expertise engagement in the critically endangered, endangered camel mm -hmm. in situ conservation. Yeah, so you made it. Wow. Right, do you want me to do it? Yeah. <laughs> You're the only person to kind of uh, I know the magic. Okay, hello everybody. Um, I'm Bridget, I'm the Research and Conservation Manager at Nosy Safari. Uh, I'm not Yaroslav, he's from Prague Zoo, he was meant to be here with us, but unfortunately he couldn't make it, so I'm here to talk about how both of our zoos work together to protect the critically endangered wild camel. Can I have a show of hands? Who has heard of a wild camel? Oh, that's good. Great, okay. Sometimes I talk about them and people go... A wild camel? What? Okay, so excellent. So you may already know some of this. Today I'm going to take us through why the wild camel is unique, um, who the zoos are that are working together to save the wild camel, and some examples of how we're using our ex situ expertise to help the in situ conservation of this species. So, little overview, critically endangered species, maybe less than a thousand you see the red question mark we don't know that's obviously a problem a big knowledge gap and we are working to fix that they're only found now in the gobi desert they're in mongolia and in china currently we're only working in mongolia the political situation in china in that area is very very challenging so not somewhere that we can work at the moment um, they're threatened by climate change which is resulting in drought so no water holes um, they're threatened by hybridization with domestic camels. They're threatened by illegal mining. Now, a couple of years ago, this wasn't looking too bad, um, but unfortunately, like many things, COVID has really exacerbated this problem and we're having a lot of problems in the protected areas. And then with the mining comes hand in hand hunting because there is not a lot to do if you are illegally mining in the Gobi Desert. So the wild camel is completely genetically unique, okay? So it's got two humps, so it looks like the Bactrium, but it's completely separate species. This was validated by um, the Vet Med Uni in Vienna. They did some genetics, um, and they are completely separate species. And that's really, really important. And what's particularly important is that we, as Yaza institutions, who have Bactrian camels as a brilliant ambassador species for this critically endangered species, get this nomenclature right. So it's a little lecture, I'm sorry, but if everybody could go back to their signs, to their guidebooks, and check that they're making sure that they explain that the domestic camels that we have are not the same as the critically endangered ones. I think the figure, it's on this, something like 80% of us are getting it wrong. Um, there's a publication coming out in Oryx soon. We don't name and shame, but we do kind of give an overview that the zoos are not getting it right. Nosley also aren't getting it right, which was mortifying, right, when I looked in the guidebook. So things to fix for all of us. Um, so all of our work is headed up by the Wild Camel Protection Foundation. It's a British NGO that also has a uh, Mongolian branch now. It was founded by John Hare, who very sadly died earlier this year. Some of you might know this. 
um, but we still have him in our minds and his um, inspiration uh, will continue. Luckily, the Mongolian NGO is headed up by uh, Dr. Adia Yadamsuran, who is an excellent, excellent um, leader for us. We've got our co-chair um, of Kate Ray, who's an environmental lawyer for WCPF UK. And then we've got a big group of partners um, that are all working together with our various expertise to try and save this species. Obviously, we've had the same challenges as every the last few day years. We went from you know, nice group meetings in 2019 to the sad Zoom meetings for the last couple of years. But April, much better. We're all back out together in the field making a difference for the wild camel. So things are starting to go in the right direction again. So I'm going to talk specifically about the work that Prague and Nosley are doing because we're the ERZ institutions that are helping. And that's what we thought would be most relevant for this conference. We're zoos, so we're working with the captive population that is at the breeding centre on the buffer zone of the species' native range in the Great Gobi Special Protected Area in Mongolia. So red, is there a pointer? Yeah, the little red area. Here is a protected area. The breeding centre is on the buffer zone, um, and it's just a, a fence around the natural habitat, basically. So in that respect, it's very good. But it's had a complicated history. Um, so it started in the 80s, 90s um, from the Environmental Administration in Mongolia. A number of camels were captured from the wild and bred. The first young came in 95. Uh, at various points, there's maybe been some new founders brought in. Um, overall, we think we've had about total 93 wild camels. And some have been released back um, into the wild in the past, some deliberately, some maybe not deliberately. So there's a lot, really, that we needed to be doing to try and get this information up to scratch. So we've got a little bit of records, um, and we see the population is going up, which is what we want in a captive population. But we also see things like this really big... Oh, that's not the right one. Yep, this really big dip here, which looks kind of like, you know, demographic... Uh, demographic catastrophe, a big drop in the population. This is just when we finally got the record straight, so we know how many individuals we have in the population now. So we've got 37 animals, 14.23. We have five calves born this year, 2.3. Um, we maybe have another three animals missing. Why they're missing is a management issue, which I'll come to in um, a few more slides. Um, but the population overall is going up. That's what we want to see. Perhaps not the rate that we would necessarily have expected. We've got a lot of problems with calf mortality and things like that. So what are we doing? Ex situ expertise. Spark stuck book management. So we're still on Sparks. We've not moved to Zim's for stuck book yet. Um, but we have a lot of issues within this book. We've got discrepancies. We've got multiple parentages. We've got unknown dams. We've got sires that are presumed because it's a dominant male, but actually the mating behaviour happens at night. So there's not been the observations. We've not been able to follow this through properly. We've got uncertain IDs. We don't really know who's who. You ask them one day, it's this camel. If you ask them the next day, it's the next camel. It's not great. So we tried to introduce some of the... Um, mechanisms that we would use in our own collections, so uh, management tagging, taking hair and faecal samples for genetic work, profile creation. In spring 2021, all the captive camels were sampled for hair samples, and they were sent to the University of Kent for genetic analysis, and we also had some historic samples from when the um, samples were collected for the confirmation that there are separate species. Um, this, this was fine, but we still had these discrepancies because we couldn't really account which camel the hair came from it. It wasn't consistent. So in April 2020, we planned to go out and have a big task to reconcile all this information. Obviously, that didn't happen. So we just got back from this task in April 2022 instead. So now every camel has a beautiful yellow earring, which is challenging. It's a wild species. It's a big tag. It's not necessarily something that we would want to do if we could avoid it. But as we all know, we need to be able to identify them individually to run this um, population the best way we can. They're also all microchipped for permanent identification because they lose ear tags, things like this. But we wanted visual IDs as well so that you could do it quickly um, and also for research purposes as well so that we can get to know a little bit more about the population. At the same time, we took blood samples from every individual. The tags that we use were DNA tissue tags, so they kind of retain the little bit of ear tissue that comes out. So we can run all the genetics again and make sure that we've got a full picture. And we've actually almost already run them in the last three weeks. Anna's been working on it, our PhD student. Um, so we're much, much closer now to kind of having a better picture of what the population was doing. 
we also made sure we took records, 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 so that we don't get into this situation again where we don't know who's who, we don't know anything about them. Um, we can trace all our data, we can make evidence-based management decisions, but also we've got novel publications available. Um, it's a massively understudied species. Um, we know a lot now about the sedation protocols because we did all of that work with the tags and the microchips understanding sedation. Um, we know a lot more about, um, about how to, to, to kind of do the, the more intense husbandry management that might be required. So we're hoping to get a nice sedation publication out of that one. Um, the herd management has been challenging the past. They're inside the enclosure from early December for supplementary feeding and to avoid possible in, um, interaction with the domestic camels. So you can see here, this is one wild camel and one domestic camel. The pointer is very temperamental. This is a wild, this is domestic. They can hybridize. This is not an ideal situation. Um, so in the breeding season, they are kept inside the fence. Um, but this creates problems with aggressive males because we have too many males in the population. Um, so we introduced a separation fence. This was something that um, we suggested. So now we have two paddocks, basically, so the males can be set to, um, kept apart that we don't want to breed from during the breeding season. Obviously, there's still too many um, males like, in the population. It's not a long-term solution, but for now, it's working. The summer management that we sort of inherited when we got on board with this project was that the adults are on free pasture and they're supervised by herders. They kind of go in three to five separate groups, many, many kilometres apart from each other and many kilometres apart from the breeding centre, which is kind of why we've lost some camels. This is not ideal and this is something that we want to work on in the future. Um, but it's felt that it's very important to let them go from a behavioural perspective and also to give them the availability of um, food. So it's a, it's a difficult one. The young always were kept, thank you, five minutes. Um, the young were kept roped at a kind of guarded area so that wolves couldn't get to them. They were with other livestock. We've kind of tried to change the situation a little bit. So now the females and the calves are actually kept inside the breeding centre still during the period when the um, calves are vulnerable to the uh, wolf predation more. Um, and they're released daily from the enclosure but brought back in overnight. So we've kind of moved that forward a little bit because keeping the young roped with the um, domestic livestock wasn't really ideal either. We've had some problems with the supplementary feeding. It was causing lots of issues, some behavioural, so anticipat anticipatory waiting. They're all kind of hanging around um, the hay waiting. A feeding from the floor, which from a parasite perspective, not ideal. It's causing... Um, <laughs> Interspecific inter um, aggression. So this is a goita gazelle that was killed by a kick in the head by a camel because it was trying to get to the supplementary hay. Um, so the, the gazelles can get in and out of the enclosure. Um, so this is a vulnerable species. This is not something that we want to happen. And also, some of the camels are kind of like dogs. They see people and they go, oh, food, I'm going to come to you. Which, for a species that threat from hunting, and maybe this is a population we might want to release from in the future, this isn't a behaviour that we want to see. So a solution that we implemented is very simple, but hay racks, so in that area, but also dotted around the enclosure so that you can feed at different times of day. You can feed at different locations, so not all the camels are kind of grouped in one place. You can um, mix up which hay racks you feed from on which time. So lots and lots of um, uh, benefits for the hay racks. We obviously want to measure that things like this have been effective, um, but COVID has kind of slowed this down because we haven't been able to get out there very much to do the data collection that we would like to have done. We've done some nice pilots at Nosley with our battery and camels, and we've been able to see um, you know, human influence behaviours, how your rearing strategy and your background of your camels is influenced by that, how adults and sub-adult camels behave differently around feeding, for example. And the concept is we want to replicate this study at Zakinus, um, which hopefully now moving forward we will be able to find a student to do that and to do that throughout the year to see how this group of camels are behaving as a group and show that some of the interventions that we've put, in, put into place have been successful, but also just learn more about how the species behaves in captivity because we just don't really know. Um, so, at the moment, we have all of our critically endangered eggs in one basket. It's not ideal. So, we're fundraising for a second breeding centre. Um, a new breeding centre has been identified. It's um, a few hundred kilometres away from the original breeding centre. It's got a water source. It's a good location. So, we've been inputting a lot into the design. But the first draft of the design was done by the Mongolian team. And what was brilliant to see was that they'd already taken on board a lot of the suggestions that we'd made at Zakinus. So... We've got um, hay racks, we've got 
a separation fence, which isn't on here, it, it was discussed. We've got additional shelters, which hadn't been done before. We've got a better crush than we'd had at the original system. So it's brilliant to see um, this detail coming into place. And I think a lot of this has been um, supported by the capacity building that we've been doing. So we don't want to go out there and do all this and then keep going every single year. The dream is that eventually we're not going to be needed to go out there and do it. So we've had the guys come over to Nosley for some training on captive management. Um, Adia has also received a Wildlife Conservation Network veterinary scholarship for some work with Prague Zoo. Um, our vet's been out to train the herders in post-mortem techniques so we can try and understand a little bit more about how the animals are dying, why the animals are dying, um, because we had very little information. The records, we had one, a camel died by sun. I don't, what does that mean? I don't know. So we're trying to get some more information. Um, and training in um, safe drug administration for worming and things like that. During COVID, obviously, we were a bit more limited. We had to think outside the box. Thank you. Um, so we filmed some of the work that we were doing at Nosley. We sent it out. We got it translated into Mongolian with subtitles and things. So safe camel moves, because there's been issues with moving camels in the past down there. One of the techniques that we've used, this was a video that guys could watch. Um, safe sedation. This was a castration, which at the minute isn't something we're considering for the population in Mongolia for multiple reasons, but just so that they can see how we work with camels over here. And again, it was just trying to find a way to do it while we weren't able to get out there in person to continue those connections, to continue the training. The camel's fine. Sorry, it's a bit of a gruesome picture for people that maybe aren't um, into veterinary work. Um, we're also very lucky that Prague have been able to fund a lot of um, kind of capacity building in country by providing a lot of kit and equipment for the um, administration of the protected area. So that obviously is very, very important for keeping them enthusiastic and excited about the project. So this is some of the examples that we're doing as zoos. The other partners are contributing to the bigger picture as well, each bringing their expertise into the various areas. So sample collection, um, conducting population genetic studies on the captive and the wild camels so that we can see if we're getting similar. We actually think there's probably going to be some less diversity in the captive population because of the way it's been managed in the past. Um, looking at population counts in the protected area so that we actually can make an informed management plan moving forward. So it's Anna, she's doing her PhD out of Dice in Kent. So we've had the samples collected um, from all the animals. We've had over 260 camera traps um, over three years spread across the Gobi, which is great for getting information on the wild camels, but also great for getting information on other species that are using that area as well. So we're getting much more information um, about what's going on in the protected area. So moving forward, we're hoping all the information that the PhD has been gathering and that we're helping to make more reliable um, information about the breeding centre and the breeding management decisions will mean that we can actually come up with a conservation strategy for this species rather than just sort of hoping things are going OK. Um, and we're also focusing on the second breeding centre so that we've got a bit more um, flexibility in what we're doing and a bit more control over things um we're fundraising from that so if anybody's trying to you know wants to get into wild camel conservation we are um very interested to hear from you and that is the end of my presentation happy to take questions now or obviously over lunch as well thank you very much for listening Introduction of Oriental tree frogs in, in uh, Riga and Alessandro di Marcio. So, once again, this terrible mouse. Can you help me, please? Hello. I don't want to touch it. No? My com I'm not so confident with technology. <laughs> Hello everybody, uh, I'm Alessandro from Riga Zoo and I will drive you through a um, brief overview on the past, present and hopefully the future of the reintroduction project of Ila orientalis. Uh, Ila orientalis is a species recently classified as a species, uh, was formerly included in the Ila arborea species complex and uh, this map of distribution show the different uh, species in which the uh, 
full uh, Ar Il Arboria complex was split. If some of you is not aware about where Latvia is, don't worry, you are in good company. It seems that this research group decided to ignore completely our population from the study. So um, basically, uh, the thing is that all the, since it's something very recent, all the information that we have about uh, conservation, like they are classified as a lesser concern or trend of population, yeah, decreasing trend of population, refer to the entire uh, population. And also uh, the uh, law about conservation, uh, it's classified as a protected species in Latvia and in European community, but as a uh, Ila arborea, not as a Ila orientalis. And that sometimes it's a problem when you apply for a conservation project because it's difficult to explain and justify that you are working with a, a species that it's endangered, maybe even more than the entire population, and, but you don't have uh, information about it. Uh, so this is why I was extremely interested in your presentation, Molly. Um, well, the origin of the project is dated on uh, 1987. Uh, the species was extinted in Latvia at the beginning of 20th century, possibly due to the uh, change of management of forest after the first independence of Latvia and management of agriculture also. And the situation became even worse with the uh, Soviet time with the intensive agriculture implementation that finally destroyed the habitat of the species. Uh, Riga Zoo uh, started with a captivity breeding program in 1987. They took 13 breeding pairs from Belorussia. Uh, the information are very few, and it seems that they came from one single point. So it's maybe an inbred population from the beginning. Uh, using this technique that I discovered that it's actually considered illegal, uh, but was not at this moment. They stimulate the uh, reproduction of this animal. And in the year, uh, we were released approximately 6,000 uh, juvenile in two uh, reintroduction points. When I started to work at this project in the uh, beginning of uh, 2019, uh, I was going on a, a critical overview of the project. It's an old project, so some of the uh, assumption of the uh, original plan are not uh, actual anymore, like uh, were not considered at all the number of the breeder, the limited number of breeder, of course, the geographical isolation of this reintroduced population, and no study were done on the genetic uh, of the breeder. Because at the moment was not uh, an issue, the different species, of course. Uh, so we start with the census, 2019-2021. The original plan was 2019-2020, but since COVID, we had to postpone it a bit. And the result is the map that you can see here. Uh, the species have a good distribution. We found uh, um, the species in a territory of approximately 7,000 square kilometers. The white spot is the territory that the species was occupying in the last previous census, uh, census of 2008. And we found also this population. Uh, we start to receive the first observation from local uh, inhabitants of the area in 2019 with just one or two uh, male singing at night. Uh, when we went in 2021 to check, we found that the uh, male chorus are multiple with multiple an animals in each one of them. So it seems that there is a breeding population, or at least people is making a strong effort every year to catch adults from the main population and bring them to have a fancy frog in the garden. Uh, some of the difference that we found with other study, all, most of the study uh, conducted in Europe are uh, related with Ila arborea, not Ila orientalis, are that uh, um, some article uh, was mentioning a strong relation between uh, Ila uh, species and beaver for the um, engineer, um, ecological, ec uh, ecological engineer activity of the beavers. In our case, we found that they are quite okay using human activity for their corpus. Uh, some of the pictures are from habitat from very natural lake till this dirty, stinky spot of water behind one gas station, and they were happy to breed there. Uh, we also found uh, one breeding point in one bath tube using the wild for uh, source of water for coal. Uh, also, river and highway are considered in multiple areas of Europe <coughs> barrier for the dispersal of the species. In the case of river, there is one interesting study uh, in uh, uh, Switzerland that they, that where they compare a river compatible with sites and characteristic with a river that crossed the territory of Ila Orientalis in 
Latvia and they found that this river, uh, it's a strong barrier for the flow of the population. And uh, highway also in uh, uh, Denmark, I think, are an important problem. In our case, due to the uh, low population traffic, it seems that it's not a big problem and apparently also they found a way to cross the river. And finally, fish, that it's um, reported as an important threat in the uh, population uh, of Sweden. In our case, we found uh, Ila orientalis breeding in a uh, lake with pike, roach and carps and tanks, even in an uh, area with the fish pound for uh, carps. The owner just say that they feed very well their carps and the carps don't need to eat the frogs. Uh, in 2021, we also started a genetic uh, pilot study. Uh, it's part of the master thesis of one of my students, and we sampled uh, 15 uh, animals from 10 sampling points that cover more or less the limit of distribution uh, using buccal and skin swab. Uh, our main purpose was the identification of the species and uh, a study about the genetic diversity. So what we found was that we were able, for the first time, to confirm that the species present in Latvia is Ila orientalis, was something that we suspect, because in Bielorussia the only species present is uh, Ila orientalis, but was not proved yet. And the species is recognizing a lot of new habitat. Uh, we also found that there are two genetic lines, and it seems for the mix of the genetic that we take from this uh, animal, that as I told, they are able to cross uh, geographical barriers, so the population is under this point of view, is going very well. There is also some bad news. Of course, these results need to be considered as a preliminary result. The number of samples is reduced. We use only uh, mitochondrial DNA, just some spot of mitochondrial DNA, so more investigation are uh, requested. But about nucleotide diversity, we found that the, uh, our population have a lower uh, diversity than the same species from the exclusion area of Chernobyl. And uh, there is also a defi deficiencies of allies um, that could be expected from a um, bottleneck uh, effect on population. Uh, as I say, that are, uh, those are all uh, things that deserve more um, research. So looking at the future, we, be, uh, we, we will be more involved in more genetic research. Uh, we want to uh, breed new, uh, uh, build, sorry, new breeding facility uh, for summer and also for wintering of the animal. Uh, the, the plan will be to raise uh, F1 population, uh, maintain them in captivity during the first year to uh, reduce the number of uh, death of, uh, during this first year and release them during the second year when they are not ready for breed but at least a bit more adult. Uh, so and with, with the new breeding population, uh, collecting animals from Poland and Lithuania, checking also the species, because in, in this area there is present, uh, it's the closest population of Ila orientalis, and there is the uh, overlap of Ila orientalis, Ira arborea, and also hybrid between both population. And so with the F1, we want to uh, make a supplementation of the existing population, try to increase their genetic, and launch a first national survey of amphibian emerging disease. It's not a problem yet in Latvia, but due to the climate change effect, we are more and more concerned about the possibility that this disease will reach Latvia soon. And the genetic, it's, it will be a problem for all the species and definitely for the uh, ILA with this poor genetic will be a disaster. Uh, how to do that? Well, uh, at the moment the project has been financed on, on, only by the um, support of the zoo. We are looking for grant. Uh, as life, unfortunately, a couple of days ago, I received the, the news that our first application was rejected, but with good commentary. So we are optimists for next year. And also uh, applying for a, um, a startup uh, uh, grant from Amphibian Arc. I want to appreciate Dalila for the collection of this information that she spread every month. I, found it very useful tools for this kind of activity. And of course, as you have seen before, we were ignored in this uh, census of the entire population of Europe, so I must give more visibility to the project. And because of that, I really appreciate that you are my very qualified guinea pig <laughs> stage. So that it's all. And if you have any questions, here I am. <laughs>
because I remember when I started in the zoo, uh, we had this amphibian arc uh, campaign, and, and from the educational point of view, frogs are great. I mean, people really do emphasize yeah. with them, so kind of like at least donating money isn't very difficult in, in the zoo surroundings. But okay, uh, yeah, Meryl, please. So uh, kind of uh, next uh, we will hear about uh, the reintroduction of this uh, mysterious endangered Persian fallow deer. Uh, and we're moving to Judean Mountains and uh, the speaker will be Nili Avni Magen from Jerusalem Zoo. So, stage is yours. Thank you. And then, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Nili from the Jerusalem Zoo. I'm the zoological director and the head vet. And I'm replacing my colleague, Nadav Ganot, our conservation uh, coordinator who could not attend the conference, and I will try to replace him. I'll do my best. And Sorry. Okay. So I would like to start from the end. This is a Jerusalem mountain. It's part of the Judean mountains. Here is the Jerusalem Zoo. This is the, our uh, deer acclimatization enclosure. It's 10 kilometers from the zoo. Here is where Nadav, our conservation uh, coordinator, lives. It's Kibbutz Tsuba. This is where I live. And this is a real example of local conservation project but I will go back to the history. So Persian fallow deer used to be common in the Levant and um, thought to be extinct in the early 20th century due to overhunting and habitat loss. Um, then in, in 1956, a small population of Persian fallow deer is discovered in the southwest of Iran a pair of founds, one adult male, were captured and brought to Opel Zoo in Kronenberg, Germany. And these individuals are the founders of the current EP population. In 1978, researchers from the Israel Nature and Health Authorities were able to bring four females from Iran. It is a real heroic story, it's the last airplane that left Iran to Israel during the beginning of the Iranian Islamic Revolution. And then later, three males arrived from Opel Zoo to form the first breeding corps in Israel. Few years after, in 1996, the first fellow deer are released to Kziv Nature Reserve at the Western Galil, Northern Israel. And this, is, this project was a success, and since then, after we estimated more than 250 individuals that uh, were in the Kziv Reserve, they began to start for another uh, release site. And then the Biblical Jerusalem, Biblical Zoo, uh, went in the picture, and we uh, found, founded the uh, second breeding core in our zoo. Nine years after, the first deer are released to the Jerusalem mountains, 2005. First, it stayed a few weeks in the acclimatization enclosure, and then are released to the real nature. And the first years of the project was a real challenging. Uh, we released from two different breeding cores, from the zoo and the nature and parks authorities. We had high mortality, um, the survivability was very low, train accidents, feral dogs, and uh, we, we held the project for two years. And then the rangers from the NPO dealt with the dogs. Uh, we uh, lowered the age of the released animals and uh, continue with the project. And 
Again, until 2017, the population monitoring was limited only to field observations, radio telemetry, and it was, not in, it was insufficient, and we didn't have a lot of data. <coughs> Uh, reintroduced population state the dynamic, dynamic was unknown, and um, we had little evidence of recruitment. And then Jerusalem Zoo took upon itself to lead the project to continue, raised additional financial support from Foundation Segray. The program um, started back to. Uh, with, with Nadav, the project coordinator, who took the lead of the project. And we had new advanced tracking methods. Uh, we're talking with the, all the GPS scholars and the trail cameras, and we were able to start and to see the, the progress of the project. And the results from the last four years, so a total of 900 and, uh, 192 uh, deer were released during the last uh, uh, years uh, with this ratio from the Biblical Zoo and the, from the National Park Authorities, uh, 100 females and uh, 92 males. Uh, we, we saw increased in a um, photo um, in the cameras. We saw a steady of uh, increase in deer photos comparison to other species in the historic nature reserve. Uh, we were able to identify both tagged and wild born adults, yearling and founds. Each year we estimated the proportion of the age in the population. And we also monitored the um, found and the yearling birth and survivability. And we saw the estimated the proportion of offspring to female from the breeding core and white born females. Um, <clears throat> since the end of, again, the positive identification since the end of 2015, 20, uh, sorry, 2018, we were able to see a nice 65% um, like of the deer that we released, we still saw them in the field. We saw a lot of uh, photo events for marked deer and unmarked deer. And again, we could estimate numbers uh, uh, in the, um, through the trail cameras. We put it in the models to, to see the population viability, and we were able to estimate um, the population, to, to predict stable population size of 144 deer. Um, in addition, we were able, we used the GPS data to calculate and estimate the home range of the released deer. We found that majority of the deer tend to stay near the enclosure, like three or four kilometers, not more than that. It was nice to see the three females that we released on the same uh, time, each one decided to, to find her own territory, didn't want to see each other anymore. Um, again, to try to identify, to identify the impact of the project, it's not easy as we were talking all the days, but the project goal was to introduce the endangered fellow deer to its historical range, to form a valuable and stable population of around uh, 200 population in sight. This was our goal. Currently, all our estimates indicate a positive trend of the establishment of a long-term population. To measure the success, again, growing population, um, evidence of recruitment, high survivability of both second and third uh, generation, founds and yearlings. And lastly, the zoo breeding core is growing, further releases uh, we, will talk, we are talking about new locations that we are planning and to ensure the future in case of catastrophe. How do we measure the impact? Since the beginning of a project, there are increasing awareness of the public for conservation. People see the deer, take photos, share them in social media. The local communities are volunteering 
Um, we do see the we use the a Persian fellow deer as a flat as an umbrella species, and uh, thanks to the <coughs> protecting of these species, we do protect all the uh, Judean mountains ecosystem. The trail cameras gave a lot of information about other species that are in the nature reserve, such as you can see in the picture, not like in Vietnam or Peru, but still nice animals around. Uh, as a vet, another impact is the research contribution, a study that compares combination of anesthetics and gives a recommendation for use in Persian fallow deer. Uh, the zoo and the nature and parks authorities are in this current project deepen the relationship and the cooperation of the two organizations, which directly benefits other conservation projects that we have in the zoo, such as reintroduction of the reefer vultures, establishing the Israel Raptor Incubation Center in the zoo, reintroduction of the ferruginous ducks, a red castler and white oryx, um, and uh, educationally, we keep showing this map in every <coughs> lecture that we give, in every opportunity, showing the involvement in local conservation in Israel. So the map of Israel and uh, the different uh, projects that we are involved with, and uh, the map makes it clear how the Jerusalem Zoo expanded his influence behind its boundaries and how zoos contribute to local in situ conservation. White oryx last in the south, southern desert of Israel. So, that's for. presentation to go. Andrea Dempsey, please, from Heidelberg Zoo. Uh, it's an example of a uh, one-plan approach connected to conservation of uh, West African primates. And uh, yeah, after that, if we have time, we can then continue with the questions. But uh, let's hear Andrea. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you very much for staying and, and listening to this final talk. Um, I just want to say hello to everybody that's watching on Facebook. Uh, just a disclaimer, I actually have the physique of a supermodel and the camera just makes me look short and fat. I just need to feel, I need to say that before uh, going any further. Um, so I'm the program manager uh, for the West African Primate Conservation Action or shortened to WAPCA because what the zoo world needs is more acronyms. So there we are. Um, and I'm going to be looking at the one plan approach and how we implement that with primate conservation. So this is its definition, as we probably all know from the SPSG group, and it's about all responsible parties um, for, um, working towards populations of species, whether they're inside or outside the range. But it's also about collaboration of those responsible parties as well, so not working in isolation, but trying to work um, together. So when thinking about what WAPCA does in Ghana, I sort of started to think about all the different responsible partners and had a bit of a, a brain vomit onto the page, which I think might be a new phrase I've just made up. And this is kind of all the people that we work with um, inside and outside the range um, for species conservation. And by doing that, we ensure that our projects are inclusive, that we're empowering local people and local entities that the projects are sustainable, um, money doesn't grow on tree, trees, I've tried, it doesn't work, and that the right people are taking responsibility for their actions. So who is WAPCA? Well, this is us. Um, uh, we're uh, an NGO based in Ghana, in West Africa. This is my team, um, from left to right. Uh, that's uh, Charles, he works in the field. Foster works in our zoos, that's me. Veronica is our project support officer. Nuria is our education and um, research coordinator, David our field coordinator, and Martin on the end is also one of our field officers. And we started from Heidelberg Zoo in Germany. It was an initiative that started in around 2001, 
looking for a project to support in West Africa for uh, West African primates. And when there wasn't one to support, Heidelberg started working with a few zoo members um, to create a project, which has now grown into a local entity. Our focal species are these four, so you might recognize them, uh, the Rollaway monkey, the white nape mangabe, uh, the black and white side colobus, and Miss Waldron's colobus. And unfortunately, we do believe that Miss Waldron's colobus is now extinct. Um, after the lunch break, uh, Florence will give a talk about the red colobus action plan, but we probably believe that uh, we got to uh, Ghana too late to save this species. Um, we're also excited to increase our focal species uh, in the coming year. So patas monkeys, there's a horrible pet trade in Ghana, unfortunately, with the patas. And the Diana monkey as well, working in Cote d'Ivoire. And WAPCA works through uh, four pillars um, of work, discover, protect, reinforce, and connect. And I'm now going to demonstrate how we do that um, through the one plane approach. And first off, how do we do that? Well, we wouldn't, as I said, be able to do it without our ERs and members and our zoo community. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank everybody that's in the room um, and not in the room uh, for supporting us throughout COVID as well, which was a horrible, horrible time for zoos. But we maintained our membership. So membership is about 2,000, well, it's not about, it is <laughs> 2,000 euro um, a year. And these guys are all our members. And they, they give that as a baseline, but sometimes also extra if they have it at the end of the year. And we're incredibly grateful for that. And we also get external funding um, from a variety of parties, again, like I say, so from IUCN, uh, from Rainforest Trust, from foundations, from our friends in America at Tulsa Zoo, from the French Development Bank, and from um, Wildlife Foundation, which is part of Yorkshire Wildlife Park as well. And local support as well. Now, this might not be financial, um, but donation of materials, which is also fantastic and helps us... Um, implement our projects. So these are all local companies in Ghana. And it's not always financial as well. So we get support from NOE, who was mentioned earlier. They're like experts in green value chain and community empowerment. Uh, Five Sisters Zoo, we partner with the conservation education department. And uh, most importantly, Paradise Wildlife Park, who actually hosts me. So I used to live in Ghana, and then I came back to the UK, and they give me an office for free. And just to say, when we were talking about resources, Paradise Wildlife Park is a small to medium-sized zoo, and they were able to find these ways of supporting conservation through other ways than just finances. So they, they support me with an office um, at, their, at their zoo, their site. So we also have two boards. We have a European board, which is made up of mainly uh, the zoo community. But we also have a, a local board, a Ghanaian board, and that's lots of different parties as well being part of um, driving us and, and um, inspiring us to work. So we have vets there, we have zoo managers. Oh, Klaus, in, you might recognize Klaus. He was on a visit. He's Heidelberg Zoo director. Um, we have architects and we have educators. We have a bank manager and we have other NGO uh, um, program managers. So, again, all these different parties coming in to manage us. And one of our most important parties is uh, the government. So the um, Forestry Commission of Ghana, which oversees wildlife, forests. Um, we've had a long-standing and very, very positive and collaborative relationship with them, which we have an MOU with, and we, we work in partnership, which has also facilitated other projects, such as um, Songbirds with Simon um, as well. So going back to those pillars, this is now talking about our activities and what we do. So with the Discover, we have the WAPCA Research Group. And this is a collaboration of a number of um, universities, both in Ghana and both international. And what's really important here is we're not just international researchers going, picking data, and leaving the country. We make sure that we partner with um, Ghanaian universities and we have Ghanaian primatologists with us and Ghanaian students as well so we can promote um, primatology in country as well and we do so what our main focus for this is to understand what's going on in Ghana in terms of monkeys um, to identify areas of conservation need but also to ensure what we're doing is effective our impact uh, bless you and to improve our welfare in our zoos as well and we've been working with all these different universities. This is a, 
a camera chat image, which was a partnership between Twikosu, the right logo, I hope, well, no, uh, at Chester Zoo and at Chester University, rather. And this is the first time we got camera trap images of the white nape manga bee in Ghana. And we're continuing that with Wildlife Foundation, Roehampton University, um, and uh, Kane University, which is in Ghana, and Zoo and Wildlife Solutions, to really now do historical surveying of Ghana to know where or if there's any monkeys left, where they are, and how we can protect them. And a shout out to Matt Hartley, who's over there, who's looking to do this with more projects if you need that. And of course, this, this then directs our conservation, but it also allows us to be part of IUCN and the Species Survival Commission, if I've said that the right way around, and the Red List team, so we, we author these Red List assessments. And we're also part of the action plan that will be published this year, she says confidently, um, as well, and we've contributed to that. So looking at Discover, those, those parties, the species specialists, the zoo community, academia, the scientific community, community and the Red List team. So when we look at protect, so when we find these primates, how do we protect them? When we do it through community empowerment, so we have this system called the Community Resource Management Area, another acronym, CREMA, and this is a government initiative that after centuries <laughs> of top-bottom management, they realise that actually the local people understand the forest, they understand its importance, and they know how to protect it and manage it. So they have this uh, bottom-up management system, which gives them the devolution of power to the local communities to manage their natural resources. And they do that democratically. They have an executive committee and then community committees, and that brings in all the members of the community, from the elders to the chiefs, and it's partnered with, obviously, Wildlife Division and the Forestry Commission. And we have two sites there. Uh, the Ancasa Tanoi Crema and the Cape Three Point Crema. Ancasa Tanoi, we've been there for much longer, and we partner with other NGOs and our colleagues in Cote d'Ivoire because we're just on the other side of the border. And we do the usual stuff. We do patrols. Um, again, talking about ex-hunters, yeah, we've, uh, we've caught people, and it's not about just telling them, no, you can't do this. It's telling them they can't do this because, and you can do this instead. And that's really, really crucial in conservation. So we have a number of hunters that now work with us. Tree nurseries for buffer zone, um, core zone, and also for sustainable use. People still need to build their houses out of wood. A conservation evangelists, it's a very religious country, so we use the church members as well. And sustainable livelihoods. Um, this is really important and part of the sustainability of the project as well because... We want it to be Ghanaian owned, owned by the, the communities. It, it is, it's managed, the decisions are made by the community, but the finances are, the economic component is often missing and it often fails. So we work with the farmers that are organic, oh, that are coconut and oko in, in Kasatanoi. And we work with private sectors so that they can improve their practices and become organic. And then they partner with those private sectors so they get a fair price. So they get a premium for being organic. And so they get a benefit because a lot of conservation threats are driven by poverty. And people need to live, they need to eat, they need to feed their family. And we need to give them sustainable alternatives to going into the forest. So not only do they get improved what they're doing, but they get a good price for it as well. And also we then create conservation agreements with the private sector. So uh, the communities and the CREMA agree to continue the protection of the forest and in return the private sector pay into a conservation fund. So not only are the communities on an individual level getting a fair wage, they also get money into a conservation fund which funds the patrols, the tree nurseries, the meetings which currently WAPCA fund. So we can start to step away and this becomes completely self-sustainable and self-financing. Um, and we're now working on that with the Ancasa Tano. We've got a three-year exit plan. And we've just started it in Cape Three Point, and we're looking at um, honey and ecotourism and perhaps one other. And it's always something that's... We do a lot of analysis of what's already being done. We don't go to a cocoa farmer and go, you know what's good? Why don't you do honey? Because they go, well, no, I'm a cocoa farmer. <laughs> I don't want to do honey. So it's always working with the communities, and they lead the project and, as I say, manage it. And uh, this is um, uh, the tree nurseries there. This is our patrol team in Cape Three Point. And we also produce coconut oil, organic coconut oil, which brings in the women of the community as well, so making sure it's inclusive. And we actually, in 2019, in the before times, we actually built our first um, community-run coconut oil processing 
um, centre, so they're producing coconut oil, for which they also get a premium as well. And we're doing, as I say, the same in Cape Three Point. Um, we also have a school exchange programme, which is quite unique, where uh, there's a school in, in, uh, in Cape Three Point that exchanges letters with schools in Scotland. So there you can see all the, the responsible parties all playing their part in the protect element of our project. So reinforce is another element of our work. So we have two captive or reserve populations in Ghana. We have the endangered primate breeding center, which is more of your traditional zoo in Accra Zoo, which is the capital city, which houses 19 mangabes in four groups and one rollaway. We are getting a female rollaway soon, hopefully. Um, and we also, and they're predominantly, well, they're not actually, they were predominantly from the pet trade, brought in, re-socialised, rehabilitated and in, into social groups, and now that's really expanded into 19 monkeys. Um, although we did quite recently get two, two ex-pet ex mangabees, but we don't see it that often anymore. And then we have the forested enclosure, which is part of Kamasi Zoo, which is up north. It's a 0.4 hectare natural area, housing nine mangabees. Um, and we're also part of the EP, so we are exchanging animals with Europe. So we've had three males go out to Europe, Lucky, Charles and Racky, and they've diversified the European population. If Elmer was here, he could probably tell you by how much, but he's not. And uh, then the offspring have come back in. So we have um, Ziggy, Accra, uh, Kate uh, and Ivy. All the females have come back in, so it's a nice circle, and we're part of that diversifying. And we're building up this population to look to see whether we can conservation translocate them back or into the wild. We're at a feasibility stage at the minute, following the IUCN guidelines, um, and it is just feasibility. If this is not a publicity stunt, if it, do, it has no conservation value, or it's not the right thing to do, we will not do it. We're not mad. Um, and that involves lots of people from IUCN, from the EP, wildlife tech, we're looking at different monitoring ways, similar to the um, facial recognition, and support from the expat community, support from the British High Commission for capacity building. So we've got a member of my team, Foster, is going to come over. Um, he got his visa eventually approved, thanks to the British High Commission. Um, the reason they denied it initially was because he hadn't travelled in the last two years. Someone forgot to tell them about a global pandemic. So that's how those parties come in. And then connect, of course. This is telling our story. This is what we do as zoos. We're telling, telling the story, and we do that through lots of educational ways. So as I was staying in the exchange program, this is the school in Ghana, and they write letters about their wildlife, and they send them to the school in Scotland through Five Sisters Zoo, and then they write back, and then they do the same activities. So they set camera traps, and they saw what different wildlife they got. And like the, 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 the school in Ghana got like pangolins and, and pottos, and the, the school in Scotland got squirrels. But it was still quite exciting. We hold a radio program um, once a month, and that's a real good opportunity to just get the general public in Ghana, and it's got a, a call-in bit so people can call up and they can talk about the laws and talk about what they can hunt, what they can't hunt, because you have open season and closed season, and you can hunt stuff and not stuff. So it's a really good opportunity to get out there with our message. Um, of course, the zoos, that's Accra Zoo, so that's where our rollaway is. He's not by himself, I should just point out. Uh, he's with a, um, a spot nose called Happy and two Mona monkeys, so he's all right. Um, and then uh, the top picture, that's Mangabe Awareness Day. Uh, it's the 1st of August every year, so if you hold Mangabees in your zoo, and quite frankly, why don't you? Seriously, why don't you? Come on, have more Mangabees in your zoos. You can celebrate that with us. Uh, that's the march that we do through the communities. Then we have a huge football tournament. We do arts and crafts. We have our own song with dance movements, um, which we can all share with you as well. And we've been part of the Waza Connect, uh, Nature Connect project as well. So that's all the different parties that uh, we work with collaboratively, inside and outside the range, to work together basically for effective, inclusive and uh, sustainable conservation. Um, so again, I just want to uh, thank again the members that are here and um, really thank them for, for starting up. If it wasn't for zoos, 
WABCA wouldn't exist. We are now handing over the process and empowerment to the Ghanaians so Ghanaians can protect their own wildlife and nature, and we facilitate that. But without, without the zoos, without Heidelberg Zoo, without ZSL, without the, the founding, we wouldn't be here. And I think we often have to justify our existence, which isn't fair, but this is, this is it. If, if, if you need a story to tell, feel free to steal mine. Um, thank you very much. And if you want to know more, we are at the IASA conference, which I can't remember where it is. I know we have mentioned it once or twice. And just that so we have an open meeting, so please come along. Um, at the World Conservation Congress, IUCN, they had Harrison Ford, and Danny has promised me that he's going to get Leonardo DiCaprio, so it's definitely worth coming. Thank you very much. So, yeah, thank you, Andrea, and thank, thanks all, all the speakers. I hope you're still here. So now it's the last momentum to ask jointly, but I mean, I think you can meet the people now during the lunch break. And uh, so um, I hope you enjoy your lunch and the rest of the conference. Uh, unfortunately, I have to leave back, back to Finland, uh, but all the best and uh, at least we meet you somewhere, somewhere there, there in the, in the months to come. So thank you everyone and, and all the best for the rest of the conference. <laughs>